Good afternoon, friends. Steve Benoon here with Israeli News Live, also Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research. And um, very provocative scripture that I have wanted to speak about for some time. And I, I have to quite tell you, I did not know that I was going to end up going down such a deep trail and examining the entire chapter of Proverbs chapter 7. But I'll tell you what really brought me to wanting to deal with this subject to begin with. And it's mainly because women are so abused from Scripture, um, belittled, put down, and many times, um, especially with men, they just do not have the knowledge or understanding of what the Scripture is implying when speaking about women. And this was one of the ones that's been on my heart for some time now. And, and I, quite frankly, I don't even know why. Maybe, could, maybe because somebody is going through this. Uh, but it's from Proverbs chapter 7. And, and it's the 27th verse that I really had in my mind. Her house is the way of the netherworld going down to the chambers of death. When you begin to read things like this, especially if you do not have the spiritual insight to really know um, what is going on, it really causes a tremendous amount of confusion. And that's what I see quite often. I, I mean, if you go back to Genesis, for example, and we read in there the fall of, of man and uh, Adam and Eve, and then we read how that the scripture says that um, when, when, when God is speaking to the woman, he said, your husband shall rule over you. And a lot of people just take that as a license as, well, the man is now in charge. He's the boss. He tells her what to do and she obeys. It's not, it's not what it is at all. It has more to do with the fact that he is in a fallen state now and they're no longer this co-equal partnership between the two of them. And because he is bigger than her, uh, he just becomes an authoritative uh, individual over his wife. So that it's more of a prophecy than it is uh, giving him a reward because clearly we know that even in the New Testament, the blame is put on him. But many scriptures like the one that I just read you is used against women as if they're just some lowly creature on the planet of the earth. And it's actually just the opposite. <clears throat> so she's not. She's equal with you. And I know that's very controversial in a lot of circles. But as I begin to break down Proverbs chapter 7, though, I actually made even a more astonishing discovery, which already knew what the last verse uh, was implying in the first place. Uh, but the rest of the chapter only strengthens that information. So I want to share this with you. My son, let's start. Chapter 7 of Proverbs, we'll read it uh, as best I can in modern English for the sake of this being translated in multiple languages. Verse 1, my son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them upon uh, your fingers and write them upon the table of your heart. Say unto wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your near kinswoman. That they may keep you from the strange woman, from the alien woman, that makes smooth her words. Now let's start with verse 4. Say unto wisdom, you are my sister. Call understanding, your kinswoman. We immediately already see the spiritual implications of this. It is from the very beginning, it's got a spiritual um, application. So we continue into verse 5, that they may keep you from the strange woman. That is literally from a woman of seed, a woman that is going to bring forth something. You can translate zara as uh, uh, 
as strange. Yes, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But it can also be as a seed, in other words, to bring forth a child. From the alien woman that make it smooth her words, or that make smooth her words, the alien woman, literally, Nachari or Nachar is from a foreign land. And that's one reason why they translate that as an alien woman. And you can't, when you look at the context of Proverbs chapter 7, the man and the woman in the, the exchange here live in the same city. So it's not like she's from other, some other city, uh, technically speaking. She talks about her husband's on a long journey in a way, as we're going to find out. And uh, she's prepared her room for him. But we're going to see as we go through this that it's deeper than that. And it's not even specifically speaking about that woman herself, but rather a spirit that is taking control of a body. Let's look at verse 5. That they may keep the, or I'm sorry, we already did that one there. Verse 6, for at the, at the window of my house, I looked forth through my lattice. Now, the word there in Hebrew is not the word lattice. All right. It's, it's just, it's an opening. It's, it's, a, it's a place to spy through. And so when I look at that, you know, ki bechalon, bechalon, chalon is a window, bayati, from, from the window of my house, and then apply that to a physical body that she's taken from the window of her own house. I, I look through my lattice. I look through this opening, this, this, this place that she's spying through. And you have to understand, as I'm telling you these things, some people say, oh, well, brother, Steve, gosh, why would you say that? This is so obvious. It's just in natural terms. Not when you really look at the Hebrew on this and not when you really look at the whole context of what's being said here. And we already know that we are the temple of God, for example. Uh, we know that our uh, there's many times the analogy is used in Scripture that our house is speaking of our own physical body. So she says from the window of her house, she looks out through, through the opening there. And I behold among the thoughtless ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. Abina, Abina, Bina comes from the word being. Literally, the, the, the root of that is being. Abina, she, she, she has some sort of a divine or an inside understanding that there is uh, one of the sons, but uh, Vebanim, one of the sons, she has, she has some sort of, there's, there's something that has been gifted to her to know that that is a son of God, and it's a young man, and he is void, or his heart is void of understanding. In other words, his eyes have not been opened as of yet to know the truth of things of what's going on. So it continues in verse 8, passing through the street near her corner. Um, this young man is, he's passing by and went in the way to her house. In the twilight and the evening of the day and the blackness of night and the darkness. And I, as I read that particular verse in verse 9, uh, I don't look at it as him being a son of darkness, but rather it still implies the darkness, the shadow is over his eyes, his heart still, as it says, he is void of understanding. And verse 10 says, And behold, there met him a woman with a tire of a harlot and of a wily of heart. And you could technically say, and behold, a woman, right? It's not just so much that he met her, but he calls out to her. So we move on to verse 11. She is riotous and rebellious. 
Her feet abide not in her house. That's another interesting verse right there, verse 11. Beviata loi shechanu regleach. Her feet do not abide in her house. From a spiritual application, in other words, now we're beginning to realize this is an evil spirit, but clearly a feminine evil spirit that has taken over a body of a woman and is using that, using that body. Her feet abide not in her house. In other words, she's not always in that particular house. Now, of course, they give you, now she is in the streets, now in the broad places, and lieth in wait at every corner. But it's done as an analogy. She's in the street, she's in the broad place, she's in every corner. How can she be everywhere? Remember at the beginning of the chapter, we see that Solomon says to embrace wisdom as your sister. It is a spiritual matter. And now he's taking you, not from wisdom, he's showing you the evil, the contrast, that evil spirit. There's an evil spirit, a, a feminist spirit, because he contrasts the, the wisdom and the knowledge as a feminine spirit, that that's what you should embrace. But then now we're dealing with a man who has no perception. He's, his heart has not been opened to know what truth is. And so therefore he is entrapped by an alien woman or a foreign from a foreign land, an evil spirit that has now taken over the body of a woman. Because you have to understand that. Because how could you say then that woman, for example, that is a harlot, wouldn't have the possibility to become a believer? Remember the, the when Jesus goes down to Simon's house and Simon doesn't kiss him welcome, doesn't wash his feet for him, none of these things, leaves him in the corner dirty. But a prostitute comes down and she realizes that's the son of God. And he goes, she goes in there and she falls down at his feet and she anoints Jesus' feet and she's washing them with, with her tears. She's tears are falling down and she begins to wash the dirt off his feet and takes her hair and is cleaning his feet off. And Simon, like the super righteous guy he thinks he is, if he knew what kind of woman that was, he wouldn't let her touch him. Not knowing that just because she had allowed her body to become a vessel used by an evil spirit, that actually that woman was a good woman inside. She only needed to be set free. So in this case here, we're looking here in, in the scripture here. She is a riotous and rebellious. Who? Who is the she? The she is that foreign spirit that has entered into that human body. For her feet abide not in her house. Now she's in the streets. Now in the broad places, lieth in every corner. She could just use any woman she wants. That's subject to that, I should say. So as I make in my notes, verse 12 seems to support the theory of verse 11 as an evil spirit. She is everywhere. Verse 13, so she caught him, kissed him with an impudent face, and she said unto him, this is interesting, sacrifice of peace offerings were due from me this day. Have I paid my vows? Oh, that, that just blows me completely away. She is needing a sacrifice. She's needing a peace offering. And if you know anything about these demonic fallen angels, as we have read in the book of Enoch, they devour human flesh. We know that there is the kidnapping of children. We know that they there, there is all kinds, of, they call them conspiracy theories, but there, there's truth to these things. I know that there's truth to these things because I know people from the inside. That evil a alien fallen demon spirit gets a hold of a female woman on the earth, uses her 
and entices, looking for, she's looking for a son of God that has not got spiritual understanding. His eyes have not been opened in order to bring him in to produce a child to the womb of this poor woman. And that's why we read in that last verse, you're going to see her, 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 her house is a house to hell. Hell, you, hell is where you're living at right now. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He didn't cut this, you know, this is not our home. But they, these demons need sacrifices. And now she says, I have paid my vows. How's she going to pay it? When she brings that man in and produces that child. Verse 15, therefore came I forth to meet you, to seek your face. I have found you. My gosh, I mean, the evil in those words just blows me away. Just the sheer evil. I have decked my couch with coverlets, with stripped clothes of yarn of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love into the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Isn't it interesting, the yarns of Egypt? Because we know Egypt is also a representation of the fallen angels and the cohabitation with humans. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He hath taken the bag of money with him. He will come home at the full moon. With her much fair speech, she causeth him to yield. With the blandishment of her lips, she entices him away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing about this one part. He will come home at the full moon. Those of you that really have eyes to see and ears to hear, I would really like to see who can put that one together. I'm not going to speak on that, but I want to see just who can put it together. I got a, we got an email from a sister recently. And also there's a brother I'm not going to call his name intentionally, but he knows who I'm speaking of. He really got it. And so did that sister. She really got it. Let's see who can pick up on he comes on the full moon. He goeth after her straightway. Now it's talking about the man that she's now enticed into there. As an ox that goeth to the slaughter, as one of the fetters to the correction of the fool. Till an arrow strikes through his liver as a bird hasteneth to the snare. And knows not that it is at the cost of his life. Now, because of the context the question is, should we have translated this as his life or its life? The word who is in Hebrew, it's is, or excuse me, it's or he. It can be either way. And a lot of times I find that it should be he instead of his. All right. So, and knoweth not that it is at the cost of his life or its life. And the reason why I say its life, because he could repent for sleeping with a prostitute. So how would it cost him his life if you know you can repent? You understand now? He does not know that this will cost its life. Why? If you brought in a child that is a hybrid child, no less. Because remember, this is what God would not forgive. They mingled the seed in Ezra chapter 9. The sons and the daughters both that went in unto the peoples of the lands. Remember that? Those children... Come in as a hybrid. 
Let's continue. Now, therefore, O you children, hearken unto me and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. He's not talking about just a woman. He's talking about that alien, demonic entity that has taken a hold of some woman to get you to cohabitate with a woman that is not even of your own people. Let not your heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, yes, a mighty host are all her slain. A mighty host. Not, and you could apply that literally, like in other words, many men have come and done these things here and brought forth all kinds of kids from all kinds of demonic entities that just end up becoming sacrificed for, for the for the devils. Her house is the way of the netherworld going down to the chambers of death. And literally, that is not talking about the woman being bad that, that, that got used by some evil spirit. Just like a man was, the man is used by an evil spirit, void of understanding that went into her. But that is letting you know that it's just the avenue that children are brought into the world. And if it's brought in via a Nephilim, like in the case of the women back before the Andaluvium destruction, they did not know that these were fallen angels. There is one of the ancient documents that said that these fallen angels were able to transform themselves and make themselves appear as if they were their husbands. And therefore they slept with them thinking it was their husbands and they tricked them into it and brought forth these damnable Nephilim. Now you see, the house was the way to, way to the nether world, bringing souls into this pit of hell. That does not make women bad, brother. That does not make your wife a bad person. This is a deep revelation so that you can see how that Satan is trying to trap and to bring in his own demonic entities into this world. And to prove that, let me just share another one here with you. This is from the Hebrew Matthew itself, and I've used this before. In Matthew, uh, I believe this is chapter 13, going down to verse 24. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows good seed. All right, sows good seed. It doesn't say in his field. We just, that's what we, they put it in parentheses there because in the uh, King James, that's the way they do it. It actually says, uh, All right. It came to pass when the men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares over the wheat. The Israel, literally, it doesn't mean over, literally it means the Israel upon the wheat. That is Berega and went away. In other words, just like we read in Proverbs, this evil man came and he sowed the wheat, in this case here, represented the daughters of God. And he come in there, an enemy by night, and literally implanted seed in those women and brought forth tares. So he can go either way. It can be the good man with a, with a bad woman, or it can be a bad man with a good woman. Either way, it came to pass when the earth grew up make, uh, to make fruit. He saw the tares, the servant of the master of the field, drew near to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed? Then where came the tares? He said to them, My enemy did this. The servant said to him, We will uproot the tares. He said to them, No, lest you uproot the wheat. But let them remain together and grow up until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather the tares first and bind them in individual bundles for burning and the wheat put into my garner. So much has been done. So much damage is done to women as a result of false teachings. Uh, on our YouTube channel, 
Israeli News Live. I do have a section where I've taught on women things like Paul's writings and stuff. Uh, if you've never listened to some of those, you might want to take a look at that. But this one was really heavy on my heart to deal with. So I wanted to take a few minutes and share this with you. And as I said, I had no idea it would take me down this path here, but I trust it's a blessing to you. I'm Steve Benoon. You're listening to Israeli News Live. Thank you for listening and God bless you.